Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look today at a new Uplook video with an on-point top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 tips on dating. So this will be a switcheroo. It was back in the dark ages when I was thinking about getting married. I know more about carbon-14 dating, which isn't much, than I do about this subject. So I'm going to give the skeleton and David will put meat on the bones. This isn't pseudo-psychology. The study is based on the Song of Solomon. So here's number one. Number one, having a direction and a goal. That's right, and we want to avoid what's called recreational dating. Mm -hmm. uh, we think of when Abraham sent his servant to go find Isaac a bride. And he says on his journey, I being on the way, the Lord led me, mm -hmm. Genesis 24, 27. So he was looking, but he was looking in God's will. Very often, sometimes people will say, you know, God will, you know, give someone to you or it will be something that almost seems like they're going to drop out of the air. And this wasn't that sort of situation. The servant went looking, but he wanted to do it in God's will. Mm -hmm. Paul's whole rationale for a relationship in 1 Corinthians is for a needed life companion. That this is the goal of looking, mm -hmm. is to have a life companion. All right, number two. You are laying a foundation. Understand that you are setting a precedent. Yes, and Boaz is an excellent example of this in his treatment of Ruth when she's gleaning. In chapter 2, we see he provides a place of security. He says, my field's open, don't go to the other fields. He gives a place of safety. He says, I've told the young men not to touch you, and a place of care. He says, if you're thirsty, go use the water that my men have drawn. And later in the relationship, we see those same things as the relationship develops, hmm. that Boaz is a place of security, of safety, and of care for Ruth. As it starts, so it continues. Now, number three, look for advice from godly believers. Yes, we do a good job at tricking ourselves when it <laughs> comes to something that we want. So allow for people with outside perspectives, but make sure that these are people that know you both and want the best for you. And when I say want the best for you, what that means is they want what God wants because God is the one who wants the best for us. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be Samson who pushes past the advice of others to get what he desires. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent point. Okay, number four have attraction to the right things. Right, and this is a big misconception. People say, well, I can't help who I'm attracted to, right? As mm. if it's something uncontrollable, this idea of attraction. But if we look at the Lord Jesus, for example, it says of him that there was no form or comeliness that we should desire him. And so it seems as if it's like, well, he wasn't attractive, mm. right? But the Lord Jesus is the most attractive person in the universe. Mm. And so it all comes down to what are we attracted to? In Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 3, we find out what the woman is attracted to in the king. And she says, his name is like a fragrant ointment. Mm. Right? So this idea of a name is not like, what he went by on his birth certificate, but his character, hmm. that his character was like a fragrant ointment. And that, that word for the fragrant ointment should remind us of the story in John 12, where Mary, she breaks this fragrant ointment over the Lord Jesus's feet, and she wipes it with her hair. 
And then when she leaves and the two separate, they still share a common scent, mm-hmm. right? There's a connection that links the two. And so when I spend time with the Lord Jesus, I create a connection with him. And if I'm attracted to the Lord Jesus, if I can catch that scent, as it were, that fragrant ointment, when I meet someone else who carries the same scent, when I see they have a connection with him, I'm attracted to them because I'm attracted to him. So we see this again in Ruth, where Boaz is acting as God's steward to repay Ruth for her graciousness towards Naomi. Mm -hmm. And so here's Boaz, and he carries that same scent, and it's attractive, and it's what attracts Ruth to Boaz. Mm -hmm. Number five, being affectionate. Yes, so if life had seasons, this would be spring. It should be easy to be affectionate. Now, if not, this should be a warning sign. If affection is difficult, those red flags need to to arise, right? Because relationships aren't 50-50. They're 100-100. And we get to see the ultimate example of the finished product in Ephesians 5, where we see Christ and his church, this pattern of submission and service. And so this is where that affection leads. And we need to keep that in mind uh, as the end result. But again, in the spring of love, this should be a very easy one. And if not, Mm -hmm. a warning. All right, number six. Do not awaken love before it pleases. And this matches beautifully with number five. Just like we should be affectionate, that should be natural and and easy, there need to be safeguards to it. Because in dating uh, this time before marriage, we don't want to awaken love before it pleases. We see this phrase twice in the Song of Solomon prior to the wedding. So the wedding is in the second half of chapter 3. And both times it's after an embraces scene. So it it describes their passionate love, that affection we talked about, and but then it it it's like they slam on the brakes and they say, "Do not awaken love before it pleases." And and the second time in chapter three, verse five, this is the verse before the marriage. Now we can see the contrast after the marriage in chapter three. We go to the honeymoon in four and. It says in verse 16, awake, Mm. right? There is this time, a good time for that love to awake, but not before it pleases. And now one thing that I think is important to remember here is that this is different for different people. What can awaken love in one person wouldn't in another. And so that requires honesty and communication between the two people in the relationship so that even though I might not struggle with something, I need to make sure whoever I'm with uh, that they don't, they aren't struggling without me not knowing. Yeah. All right, number seven, have no appearance of evil. Your testimonies matter. Right, so the internal side of things is not awakening love. The external side is no appearance of evil. We don't want to pursue Hollywood lifestyles, but we want a lifestyle that pleases God. And our testimonies matter. And so not just the internal, but we need to be mindful of the external, what others see. All right, number eight, be a walled garden. What does this mean? Yes, we went with the figurative language of Song of Solomon for this one. All the way through the book, the woman is pictured as a walled garden. And now this is interesting because she's in a relationship with a king, right? And it's a walled, locked garden. 
The king does not have access until again in chapter 4. He's bidden to enter, right? This walled garden. And so this is this idea of exclusivity, right? Throughout the relationship until that time where love is awakened. Mm-hmm. And this is the key to faithfulness we see in chapter 8. So at the end of the book, the last chapter, uh, this is when the, the couple has been together. And it says in verse 7, beautiful verse, it says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. So this great love, this enduring love, how, how did this come to be, right? If I want that for myself, I want to know the secret. And it tells us with a little flashback. So it goes to a conversation between the woman's brothers. And uh, they say, we have a little sister. Okay, And what are we going to do about her when someone comes asking for her? Okay, This is the, the scenario. Apparently, they have responsibility for her. And this is what they come up with. They say, if she is a wall... We will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. They say, when someone comes asking, how will we know if she's ready? How do you know if you're ready for a relationship? And here's the answer. If you're a wall, if you're that walled garden, and you've learned the exclusiveness, they say, we're going to... Put on you the silver, you're you're ready to go. But if you're a door, if you haven't learned this and have allowed people in and out of this walled garden, they say, we're going to enclose her with boards of cedar. And what is an enclosed door but a wall? And so this even gives us that step that if someone has spent time as a gate, as a door opening and closing, to spend time as a wall in preparation for that long-lasting faithful relationship. So number nine, attack potential problems. Yes, so in Song of Solomon 2, verse 15, the couple's together and they say, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. So little foxes in a vineyard, what they like to do is eat the fruit before it's ripened. So this is uh, a good picture that we need to deal with certain things before we enjoy ripened fruit, right? This is, again, Mm -hmm. that idea when after the wedding, we enjoy the fruit of each other's love. But before that we have to stop these little problems and if we don't it's going to destroy that fruit that we could have enjoyed and so we need to be proactive with this and it's balancing that springtime affection with foundation building right that that we're confronting issues in the time when it's easiest right in that springtime you know uh, you know they can do no wrong well if that's the case let's deal with the real problems things that are going to again lay that foundation for a successful relationship we see this in boaz and ruth again ruth has a problem before they can get married her problem is that there's a closer kinsman redeemer Mm. and boaz needs to deal with it and we see how he deals with it he does it quickly Right? Naomi says, it'll happen today. And so we need to do the same. When we see a potential problem, we need to catch the little foxes before they have a chance to spoil the vine. All right. Uh, Number 10. I'm sorry we're here so soon. I've been enjoying (laughs) this. But uh, number 10 is determined to follow the will of God. Right. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Right? And this could be a death of a relationship. That when we try to cut our own path in life, we know where it leads. 
And so if I want a relationship that is going to be the best for me, I want it from God. And so finding the person to share my life with, this needs to be one of prayer. A search uh, that's, that's closely knit with communication with God. And not just in the preparation, but through the relationship into marriage, following God step by step because he knows the way and he wants what's best for us. Well, there's a lot of wisdom there. We're not going to get this out in the world today. Everything is completely fallen apart in this area, but we're thankful that we can go back to the book and see. We don't have to depend on human wisdom here. We've got the Word of God to, to guide us. So thanks so much, David. That was excellent.